So we got to talk about some of the outcomes, what we're hoping for as the bigger picture. And now we're going to focus a little more on the method, which is something that we've developed out of noticing what works and what doesn't over the last five years of accompaniment. So the first method is having a strengths-based perspective. What this means is often, uh, again, because of our own personal privileges, we, which we all have some privilege, um, whether that be racial, education, um, language, citizenship, you name it, it's really easy to see people and com whole communities as having deficits and needs. And what we hope for instead is to focus on their assets and capabilities, which is their strengths. There's all sorts of different strengths. It's things you're, you're able to do with actions, with your hands, it's knowledge you have. A strength can be what you're passionate about. Um, and a strength can be how your ability to create that human connection. Having a strengths-based perspective is going to set us up to believe that people are capable of reaching their goals, despite all the barriers they may face as having recently arrived here. So uh, for example, with the example of the family that was Finding that found work building fences. It would be easy to have assumed as a team member that the only way they could have found work is if I found it for them. Um, and that even if they found work, I would need to ar arrange for them to get a ride to the work, translation at the work site, um, and possibly dictate to them what the details of the job are instead of trusting their abilities. So for example, I might have thought that I needed to choose the type of wood to get, the design of the fence, um, what type of nails, blah, 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 all the little details I could choose for them if I didn't think they were capable of making the best decision themselves. Um, because I might have thought of them as just the labor, but really a strengths-based perspective would be focusing on giving them ownership over the job, trusting them to make the decisions of what's best for that job that they're doing. Um, and at the end of the day, arranging their own ride and finding a way to communicate, which often is done over text through Google Translate. So uh, we have had those circumstances and I just thought that's a good example of different ways of looking at the same situation with a strengths-based perspective. So what we would like to do to help people get practice uh, with the concepts of accompaniment is we are for the rest of the training going to be accompanying a woman named Raquel. And this is a woman, her story is based on true stories of people that we've accompanied. So uh, here is Raquel's story. Can someone please read her story out loud? Meet Raquel and her family. She fled death threats in El Salvador from gang members who destroyed her business and kidnapped her son. She arrived to the US six months ago with her two children. They were separated from each other at the border. She is currently in the Adelanto de detention facility while her children are living with a distant relative in the Bay Area. She hopes to reunite with them soon. So our next method is focusing on building trust. And what we really want you to know about building trust is what may seem obvious, which is that it takes time. Um, it's important to be intentional with this and, uh, and to receive people with what we call unconditional positive regard. This term means that you are seeing them as, as that they're always having the best intentions so that when something may happen that is, is a little bit of a disconnect and feels like there isn't trust there, you are focused on being curious to understand their perspective 
and listening and affirming their viewpoint and approach. Um, so what's an example of this? So we had a, a family who, sorry, just a second. We had a family who they, not a family, an individual who got here. Um, amazingly, he actually won his asylum while he was in the MPP program, which you may be familiar with, where people are trapped in Mexico until they have their court. So he, he was one of the very few who won his case. And so his destination in the US was the Bay Area. So he got here, he started resettling and he ended up getting himself a car. Um, and he needed this car to get from where he was living in Pinol to his job in South San Francisco, which on public transportation is a two hour ride. However, his housing host um, was afraid because from her perspective, he should not drive unless he had a driver's license, which he did not have yet. And rather than trusting him to make his own decisions because he is an adult, she got into the role of parenting him and in fact, put a lot of pressure on him not to drive, which caused his work to suffer because he had to take public transportation four hours a day. And in the, at the end of the day, wasn't really able to get to work. So in this case, I highlight this because I don't believe that that volunteer was, uh, was considering him with unconditional positive regard. I don't believe that they were seeing him as capable and able to make decision, his own decisions, believing that they were the best decisions for himself they probably believed that their decision for him was the best way to go. Um, another point that we'd like to highlight is that trust and relationship building is a slow process. So we want to be mindful of the questions we're asking people. We don't, we're not um, entitled to know all the details about their life just because we're accompanying them and care about them we want to wait for them to share information with us um, as they're comfortable. Yeah. And, and recognize that we may never know. They may never share with us many details about their life, including how they got here or why they came or whether they're going for asylum or not. So um, we will be sharing a resource with you called, it's a blog, um, what is that called? Podcast called... NPR code switch. And if you're able to later in this um, podcast, you can hear this, you can hear a woman who shared her, she had her story and it was to be shared with a congregation. However, in this example, she's talking about how it didn't go well because when her share story was shared, pieces of information were shared that she did not give permission to be shared as well as um, it was sort of used unethically. It was used to raise money for the congregation rather than just herself. So if you get a chance later to review that, it's a great way to set the mindset of confidentiality and that when we are including our congregations in our accompaniment experience um, to do so again with the strengths-based perspective and with permission from the person that you're accompanying. So the third method we're going to talk about is really important. This one is called boundaries and um, the reason we talk about boundaries is because we really, it's so important to maintain a healthy relationship uh, when we're accompanying someone. Um, so here we can see a list of things that we are not when we're accompanying them, but that are really easy to kind of fall into the trap of becoming. What, and then an alternative of how to move that dynamic into a healthy relationship. The 
easiest way to draw a healthy boundary is by using the idea of self-sufficiency as a kind of like a, a marker, like is what I'm choosing to do right now to accompany this family, helping move them toward self-sufficiency. Um, and we will be having a module which reviews self-sufficiency more, but I just wanted you to hear that as kind of that marker of how you can determine um, how to make healthy decisions. Um, one example I have of this is that when there was a family who told, when accompaniment first started, so imagine the Nueva Esperanza accompaniment team is a six month long commitment. So when the team first started and the family had just gotten here about a month before, they needed help um, enrolling their daughter in school. So the team was able to lead them to where the local um, district office was to enroll the child in school. She started school and the mom of the family told the team that it really wasn't going well for her daughter and she needed to talk to the teacher. So one of, so the team interpreter set up a meeting and they all met and tried to problem solve what was going on at that school. Um, they also introduced the mom to the school principal so that she could reach out to both the principal and the teacher on her own later. And unfortunately, the mom, the next time that this came up about two months later, the team did the same thing. They set it all up for the mom. And then when it happened again, two months after that, they did it again. Um, and so by the time they were about five months through accompaniment, the team was getting burnt out because they were doing a lot for the mom that the mom was, was capable of doing herself because she had already been linked to the resources of contacting the school uh, directly herself. Um, and so we really, in that example, it would have been helpful if they had asked themselves like, what can I do differently so that the mom is being more self-sufficient with the resources that she's aware of in the community. So here's a little bit more information about Raquel. We're continuing Raquel's story. We had the experience of her in detention, all the information you learned about her, realizing what about her can, what can we do to promote her case so we can support her to advocate for release. And thanks to the congregation that you're working with, she's released and now she's in your community. And I'm can someone read briefly what you see on the screen about the next update about Raquel? I will. Raquel is out of detention and she got her kids back. She's sleeping with her two children in an office storage space. She knows where the food bank is, but cannot leave her children alone to get there. Her son is having flashbacks of his kidnappers torturing him. She needs to enroll her children in school, but doesn't have proof of residence or immunization records. She has her first ICE check-in in San Francisco next week and is afraid to go because she has a criminal record. Um, I tried to put in response, like real responses you might think of because I think there's a difference between what you choose and what your impulse is. So like with number one, uh, my impulse might be to move her into my garage. I've got a garage, like that's gonna be better than an office storage space. However, it's not the choice I'm gonna make because it's not the, it's not healthy. Um, and at the end of the day, many of these things are learned it, with experience and with the support of your team. So um, with Nueva Esperanza, you will rarely be making a siloed decision by yourself it's more about the mindset of how you approach people um, accompaniment. So the example I gave about the um, school, helping in school, it's not that you like give people information to a resource once and expect that from there on that out, 
they're independently accessing that resource. It's more like a process, a natural process over time that they would become more self-sufficient. So whereas you may arrange this meeting with the teachers and the principal the first time, perhaps the second time, um, oh, and the first time you go with them, perhaps the second time you arrange it, but you don't go with them. And then perhaps the third time you'd simply remind them of the phone numbers and offer to be on the call when they arrange it themselves. So they're, and then by the fourth or fifth time, hopefully they're doing it on their own. So often um, there are a lot of barriers to why people are not accessing resources, just like lickety split by themselves. And it's important to be willing to walk them through it, but also again, with that goal of we're going towards self-sufficiency over time. Second, Raquel knows where the food bank is, but cannot leave her children alone to get there. Which of these is not a healthy response for you to choose? And again, pay for her groceries and get delivered on Instacart. It's just easier. And the trick about that is, for some of us, something convenient and quick for us, it's easy, right? But oftentimes we have to take three steps back to really think about the question Kelly said, will this lead them to self-sufficiency in the long So the last method is focused on self-awareness. Oh, self-awareness, especially of race and power. We like to create self-awareness with a tool called um, a social location map. So we're going to take about three minutes. I know it's really short, but um, we're each gonna make a map of our own social location. And what do we mean by this? We mean naming the different characteristics and qualities that place you where you are in our society. We want you to be aware of the parts of your social location that are a, considered an advantage or a disadvantage because this impacts how you are perceiving the family that you're accompanying or the person that you're writing with in detention. And it also impacts um, what you can do during accompaniment. So what do I mean by this? Um, our social location creates our personal worldview. And that is usually, that can be very different than the worldview and social location of the person or family we're accompanying. So an example of this is that we accompanied someone named Gregorio, who was also living in an RV with his 15 year old daughter. And the accompaniment team, what because of their social location, was pretty disturbed to find out that when his living condition was not only an RV, but an RV with no power, which meant his daughter was studying by candlelight and they had no bathroom. So they would go to the local park and use the public bathroom. Um, and they had no way to cook. So, and there was a hole in the roof. So they were afraid for the rain. So from the team's perspective, they, this was not okay. They, we need to get Gregorio out of here. We got to find him a better place to live. Maybe he's going to get reported to CPS because um, his daughter has no access to a bathroom et cetera, et cetera. But from Gregorio's perspective, he was very content. Having a roof over his head was a better condition than the conditions he had come from in his own country. Um, and besides that, his priority was having privacy. It was meaningful to him to be able to provide that space for his daughter. So at the end of the day, the team pushed and pushed and pushed because they were prioritizing their worldview coming from their social location. And they moved him into someone's home and he only stayed for one night and then he left and went back to his RV 
because it's not where he wanted to be. Um, so that's just an example of how it's really important to be aware of where you're coming from and how it influences accompaniment. And choosing instead to center the, so, the worldview that's coming from the person's social location that you're accompanying. Um, another reason we reflect on our social location is that you may have um, things that you're accustomed to because of your time in this country or your location in this country that can be used to center the voices of people who are directly impacted and just got here. So an example of this is that in many cultures for people who just got here, um, what would be considered normal is being very humble and saying nothing when faced with someone who you see as in a position of authority. So at a doctor's office, even if you have a problem or disagree with what the doctor's saying, you would never ask a question or say something because it's just not your cultural norm. And so um, using your social location could be that because of your, um, because perhaps of your skin color, you'll be taken more seriously by the doctor or perhaps because of your language ability, you will be listened to more by the doctor or perhaps because of your social location, you, um, are more able to add, you are able to self-advocate um, coming alongside them to help them advocate for themselves in the doctor's office would be an example of centering their voice using your social location. And lastly, we want to be aware of how race impacts all of this. So race impacts our perception of how we see the person that we're accompanying and the reasons that we go into accompaniment. Um, Miriam, do you want to speak to that? Yes. So as you can see, there's a lot of conversation right now about racism. And we want to make clear that what we're talking about here is a, an aspect of racism that is more subtle and more subconscious because it's cultural. That's why it's a racialized perspective. And it's not to put a stigma if you have or have not um, had this because this is cultural. So you see here, there are different perspectives. The first two could be a racialized, like people from this specific skin color have this tendency to see others with this condition the situation. So if we, for example, the story of Raquel, they're racialized if a person is from a third world country or has an, any different disadvantage, this racial concept of um, victim. And again, this is a cultural ongoing concept that needs my help. And then there's another one of the criminal. Again, historically within the US, it is affiliated more to black and brown people of color and the racialized perspective is that this person should be afraid of or we should think about twice whether we can accompany them or not if they are if not they had a criminal background however when we check those racialized cultural concepts and i can admit that i've been the because i grew up in the us me being a person of color when we check ourselves and we understand how white supremacy has this racialized culture towards specific, we can check ourselves and move to the second two perspectives of a person who has experience of being oppressed or is um, of a disadvantage. We can see them as resilience, like we talked about strength-based. And then also, we can also see them from their strengths, how they were coping with a difficulty, seeing a bigger perspective. So it's just an invitation to have a deeper self-awareness of more subtle cultural cues that we or people that we are working with in our congregations have when we are talking about how do we support immigrants in our country. And at the end of the day, what we're hoping for is that with these different racialized perceptions and social location and all these things, we want to, again, root ourselves in our faith traditions and in our beliefs 
that humanize us and um, bring us together in the beloved community. Oh. That concludes the content of our training. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining.